By August 1989, Soundgarden manager Susan Silver has come across yet another Seattle-based band that she feels deserves international attention. Nirvana, more specifically Kurt Cobain, a new, dark and cynical yet sarcastic visionary who has amassed a cult following within the underground indie punk rock scene. Sub Pop has given numerous bands chances they never thought they'd have, but they have spread themselves too thin. They're bouncing $100 checks. They can't pay all the bands that they're pushing out. Sub Pop is sending bands not only out on American tours, but on European tours where these bands often get stuck. Their van breaks down. They don't have money for a hotel and they have to camp out by a fire or sleep in the van. They don't know whether they're going to get their next meal or not. These amazing artists that were under Sub Pop's tutelage could not even even pay their rent to assure that they will have proper housing. They're having to use money from the shows that they do just to get to the next show. In short, Bruce Pavitt and Jonathan Poman of Sub Pop are in over their heads. Bruce and I knew exactly what we were doing from the beginning. No, we had no clue. They're writing checks they can't cash and making promises that they know they're not going to keep. For a long time, Kurt and Chris were underestimated. Bruce and Jonathan were still living in the 80s and did not see the storm approaching, the musical revolution that was approaching. Kurt and Chris were, in essence, taken advantage of by Bruce and Jonathan. The scene was buzzing and Sub Pop was making the most of it. Jonathan Poneman and Bruce Pavitt just sort of fashioned themselves as these sort of Clive Davises of grunge or something. Those guys were real hustlers. They were great at slogans and packaging. You knew you were being hustled, but it's, it felt important. I don't think uh, they should take this in a bad way, because I wouldn't. I mean, they're very successful, but they're the biggest liars in the world, man. They were put on the back burner and just left there to simmer. Because Sub Pop does not pay much attention to Nirvana, and does not promote Nirvana, does not put a lot of money into Nirvana, Kurt and Chris and Chad record a demo, what would become Nevermind, we're talking songs like Breed, Poly, Lithium. They record it into a tape deck, like the old school tape decks where you just hit play and record. They played a seven song demo into a tape deck. Kurt had this new material to record and he decided that if his independent record company wasn't going to promote him and pay for a recording session, he'd just do it the old-fashioned way and promote himself. He makes bootleg tapes. They get passed around throughout the music scene. Even through all the distortion and static and lo-fi quality, you can still hear the superb quality of the songs themselves. And this is why in 1989 you see Chris Cornell, who is is a rock star, Soundgarden singer, wearing a Nirvana shirt, standing next to Andy Wood. Chris Cornell was dating Susan Silver. Susan Silver and him would actually end up becoming married only a year or two later. So he heard the Nevermind demo before anybody else in the world did and knew how good of a band Nirvana was. And even though they're bootleg, these tapes were so good that people re-recorded them. They got passed throughout the music scene and by late 1989, Soundgarden manager Susan and Silver has heard this demo. Butch Vig has heard this demo. Everybody's talking about who is Nirvana, who wrote these songs. Susan is so impressed by this demo that she seeks out Kurt and Chris and introduces them to an entertainment attorney by the name of Alan Mintz. Alan is the one who takes the demo around to all of his connections with the big record labels and creates a lot of buzz for Nirvana. On top of that, Thurston Moore and Kim Gordon, a married couple from Sonic Youth were already signed to Geffen Records and they were fans of Nirvana too. Sonic Youth even invited Nirvana to open up for them on a short two-week European tour in which Nirvana got to play their very first large music festival, which was the 91 Reading Music Festival. And this was an invitation that Sonic Youth gave to Nirvana pre-Nevermind. One month before Nevermind releases, Nirvana's overseas playing the Reading Music Festival with Sonic Youth. 
too. They knew how great he was. The rest of us just didn't know yet because we had yet to hear the demo. So you got Susan Silver and Thurston Moore and Kim Gordon all pushing for Nirvana to be put into a major record label. The two people who don't understand how good these songs are? The very two guys who have this band under contract. Now in my own humble, meager opinion, I believe that Kurt did not recognize what was going on because he had been left out in the cold his entire life. His own family practically disowned him. He was used to being treated unfairly, to being the black sheep. And Nirvana was the black sheep of Sub Pop. That's how Bruce and Jonathan treated them. But after several months of this demo tape being re-recorded and passed around, all of a sudden, the suits come a-knocking. These big record company executives are knocking on Sub Pop's door, wanting to know who Kurt Cobain is, wanting to know who Nirvana is, wanting to buy them out of their contract. It takes Kurt quite a while, several months, to understand how much people are beginning to love him and his music. It takes him quite a while to come to terms with it, if he ever did. Kurt may have never came to terms with the fact that the world loved him, but he does, however, come to terms with how poorly he was being treated by Bruce Pavitt and Jonathan Poman, something he describes in Michael Azared's book, Come As You Are. The demo tape has been circulated, the big wigs from the big record companies have come knocking, and Bruce Pavitt finally realizes what a jewel of a musician he has under his own tutelage and realizes Kurt is now in a position to get away from him. All of a sudden, Bruce and Jonathan have decided that they do want to promote Nirvana. They do want to invest money into Nirvana, and that becomes the April 1990 Smart Studios sessions, the professional demo, seven song demo, that would become Nevermind. Kurt allows Sub Pop to pay for the demo with no intentions of staying with Sub Pop. This is a quote from Kurt Cobain talking about Bruce Pavitt coming to his home to basically beg him to stay with Sub Pop. Quote, for the first time, Bruce actually seemed like a human being to me. Every other time I'd see Bruce, our conversation was always real limited and we never got to talk to each other on a human level. I also felt some kind of resentment because why all of a sudden at that point did he decide to treat me like a person instead of this casualty every time I came into his office? This gives us a little glimpse into the relationship that Kurt had with Bruce. Kurt wanted to be friends with Bruce. Kurt wanted Bruce to give him advice and, and talk to him on a personal human level and Bruce brushed him off. It wasn't until Bruce Pavitt saw Kurt Cobain and dollar signs as synonymous with each other that he actually treated Kurt like a human being and Kurt was smart enough to understand I'm not gonna let this guy take advantage of me anymore I'm done with him in the end as we all know Chad Channing is kicked out of the band Dave Grohl comes in a and representative Gary Gersh from DGC Records wins the guys from Nirvana over but not before Sub Pop gets out of all their financial trouble Sub Pop not only gains huge fame and notoriety for being the independent label that found Nirvana. They also get a big fat paycheck which single-handedly prevents them from filing bankruptcy in 1991 and Sub Pop also makes it a part of the contract when DGC purchases the contract that they have to put Sub Pop's label on the back of the Nevermind album, an album that would go on to be the most iconic, most recognizable rock album of history. These two guys from Sub Pop get their label on the back of it. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, why you see Sub Pop's label on the back. It was part of the deal. I believe had Bruce Pavitt and Jonathan Poman treated Kurt Cobain like a human being, he would have stayed with Sub Pop. I believe that Kurt left Sub Pop for that one simple human reason. Interaction. Connection. These guys never once tried to see Kurt Cobain as a human being. He was an asset. Not only was he an asset to them, he wasn't a very good asset until the very end when DGC came and gave him a big pile of cash and got them out of financial trouble. Then Kurt was worth something to them.